in that, and I kept thinking about the, you know, it's the sister programs to this, Band of Brothers and the Pacific. And of course, being an avid reader of all World War II stories, uh, books, uh, you know, bios, et cetera, et cetera. It just seems like so much of it comes back to the brotherhood that these men formed with each other uh, in the face of such tremendous uh, danger. Uh, and that's what drove them back in, you know, every day into that plane. It's also what drove those Marines back to every beach that they they went to. It's also what drove those men of the 101st Airborne, the 82nd Airborne, and the 28th Division and 29th Division and all those divisions back to the front lines every time. So I just want to offer that comment. Anybody want to follow up on that? I'd, I'd be more than welcome to hear a, a couple of opinions before we jump, jump into our program. You know, uh, yeah, I think Colin would agree with you that it was the best episode. Um, Carol and uh, Carol Wagoner emailed me after the episode aired and said, how did the interrogator, played by that wonderful actor, uh, how did the Nazi interrogator know that Bucky was from Manitowoc, Wisconsin? If, if, if you could hold off for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I got a slide on that. From, All right. Uh, I can uh, tell you more. <laughs> Marilyn can answer that question. Uh, take the next forty-five minutes to answer that yes. question if we wanted to. But that's part of our our program for tonight. Yeah. You want can me I, to take to later, or? Well, let me introduce everybody uh, right now. If I, I'll take the screen uh, at this point. Uh, Todd. Yep, it's all yours. Okay. And let me get this uh, going. So both, um, uh, all of our guests, whoops, wrong way. All of our guests uh, shared lots of different uh, slides with me um, over the last couple of days. And I put them together in this PowerPoint. I couldn't oh, show yeah. all the slides because there's just too many. Um, and there's story after story after story. So we've got to be selective and tell a few stories. Um, these are some of the books that Marilyn Walton has written. I couldn't put them all up because I just didn't have enough space. I didn't know how to put up, but they're all uh, available. And uh, Marilyn was all one. up because I just didn't have enough. <laughs> what happened there? Um, Marilyn was one of the technical con technical consultants to uh, uh, the Masters of the Air episodes on Apple TV, and her specialty is obviously POWs. So, Marilyn, what was that like becoming a technical consultant to the to the program? Well, it, it was a great surprise, of course. At first, um, it was really a lot of fun. I got into it in 2017 as a script consultant for uh, John Orloff. And um, we worked on that for quite a long time. Of course, it was filmed in the UK and I'm in the United States. And so uh, during over past those, those over those years, a lot of phone calls went back and forth, a lot of emails when they wanted information. Um, and the book that you see from Interrogation to Liberation that I did with a co-author, that book weighs uh, four and a half pounds. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see how thick it is there. It's a really big book. And that's the one that John Orloff used continually. He's read the entire book. And I know he drew a lot from that book. Uh, the middle book was when I wrote about my father. That's the first book that I had uh, done. And then the other one is available now for the 80th um anniversary of the great escape and uh, Mike Everhart and I put that together to give to the uh, uh, people that participate when they go back. But for me uh, to work with them, I, I worked a lot with Kirk Sadusky. Um, I've known him for a while and he's always delightful to work with. And he, um, we have exchanged a lot of information over the years. <laughs> wow. Must be just wonderful to, uh, see your uh, efforts on screen in one way or another. I'm sure it can... is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And the first thing I, and I told Kirk that if, if, if nobody takes anything away from this 
uh, production, but I know they will take a lot away. The one thing that we really wanted to come out that is probably the the biggest mistake that people uh, make when they write about the camp, Stalag Luv 3, that it is when the prisoners were there, they were always in Germany. They were never in Poland. And that mistake is in so many, it's in books, it's in productions. And it is confusing because Poland has a very strange history of its borders. But the camp is now in Poland, but only because of war reparations, that part of Germany was given to Poland. So um, I told Kirk early on, I said, just make sure because even the president of Poland is upset about that. And he's trying to make sure that people know that yeah. the camp was not in Poland at that time, or it's only there now. Poland comes and goes over history. It does. Know. It has very <laughs> strange uh, history of border changes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Marilyn, for being here. And next, thank you. let me go deeper with uh, Colin Heaton. Colin, thanks very much for being with us tonight. And again, a prolific writer. And these are just three of his books, which I just sort of randomly picked out. Um, Colin, how did you get involved in becoming such an expert on air war over Europe? How long have you been doing this? Well, I read Ray Tolliver's first book when I was eight years old. <laughs> and, and it locked me onto it. And then by the time I was 14, we were pen pals. And then by that time, 16, I'd met a bunch of the German fighter pilots, British fighter pilots, and American fighter pilots at symposiums. When I got to middle school, high school, uh, I was in a history club. We'd travel around to these events. So I talked to the guys, you know, and, you know, and back in those days, I didn't speak German. So uh, it was good that their English was better than my teachers. And uh, then as I joined the military station in Europe, you know, I told Ray Tolliver, hey, I'm going to be in Germany. And he's like, stand by man i'm going to shoot the letters out mm -hmm. and he opened the doors for me and i began interviewing and interviewing and every weekend pass we had every everybody was going to get drunk and chase girls and i'm on a train going to munich or ingolstadt or part or somewhere else stuttgart you know i'm tracking these guys down and uh and over time i thought my dad said when i was in the marine corps i was in the army then i was in the marine corps and then my dad said what are you gonna do with all these damned interviews and i said i'm gonna write a book and he goes well, you better learn how to write a book. And so then I got out and went to college and in grad school. And one of my professors said, you know, because Night Fighters was my master's thesis. Ah. And, and he said, uh, how did you get the interview with Wolfgang Falk, you know, the creator of the Night Fighters and Bill Reed, B.C., Lancaster Pilot and all these other guys? I said, I'll start with Ray Tolliver. And then he put me in with Doolittle and Galland and, and everybody else. And it just kind of cascaded to where I was very lucky to get these guys. And they trusted me. And I I I. That's why I turned down half a million dollars on the Star of Africa becoming a movie five years ago because they wanted to make it a story that it wasn't a true story and I couldn't take the money and betray their their trust. Wow. Very admirable. Wow. We're, we're fortunate to have you. Let me back up to Marilyn. One thing I forgot, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. uh, Marilyn is uh, uh, interested in the POW experience because her father was a POW. Yes. Uh, flew yeah. with them. 458th bomb group right he was shot down in june june 18th 1944 on his third mission yeah. he had gone to the rocket coast of france on two missions and then he was shot down uh over germany on his third mission mm -hmm. and um at that point he they had taken off they went the northern route um, and they dropped down over holland in the frisian islands and they got as far as hamburg when their plane took flack and it was an old plane anyway. It wasn't their own original plane. And at that time, the war in 1944, you didn't want to be shot down around Hamburg because it had been, um, no. <laughs> it had been um, bombed so many times that it was very dangerous with the civilians on the ground there. And they were hanging pilots and crew from lamppost at that point. So he managed to get past Hamburg and uh, they started what you see in Masters of the Air on one of the flights when they're throwing everything out, out to lighten the plane. The Norton bomb site went out, all the guns just to lighten it and see if you can get a little further. And that's what he did. And he went down in a beautiful little farm community up near the Danish border, but it was in Germany. Yeah. yeah. 
And then our third uh, member of the panel tonight is Anita Sibesma. I got it, Anita, didn't I? <laughs> Close enough. Yes. Anita is the historian for the 96 Bomb, Bomb Group uh, Association, uh, which her father served in. Yes. Uh, and he was also a bombardier, as Marilyn's father was. And also, navigator. Or navigator, I'm sorry. Navigator. navigator. And also became a prisoner of war. So we have two daughters of prisoners of war tonight. Uh, <laughs> tell, tell us a little bit about the Bomb Group Association. What what, what does it do? What What's its purpose, uh, Anita? Its purpose is to keep the memory alive. Oh, thank you. Um, of the men who served in the 96th from its inception in 42, when my dad went in, through 320 missions plus the Chow Hound missions and keep their memories alive for their families and others to appreciate what they gave to the war effort. Well, and and uh, as I've come to know over the past few months, uh, I, I, I take it there's a bomb group association for every one of the bomber groups that flew out of England? Is that Seems like it. Yeah. Which are, there were how many bomber groups flew out of England? 46? Do I have that right? I think that's the number I've read before. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's let's get into our story a little bit. Uh uh, Nita, recognize this handsome young man? Yes, that's my dad at at 20 years old at Texas A&M. The summer after his sophomore year, the recruiters came on campus and he joined July 1942. Went through the training with the Wonder Coyote, Walla Walla, uh, Rapid City. Then in April of 43, he and his crew flew to Snetterton Heath and helped establish that base. They were the founding fathers. Okay. And that's the 96 bomb group. 96 bomb group with four squadrons. Yep. In Maryland? I recognize him. <laughs> I, I take it he had to be super handsome to be in the Eighth Air Force. Yes, yes. He Is was that a requirement. I, I would have made. They I, I all look good in uniform. Yeah. I'd have been one of those fighter pilots, like Joe. I guess. I mean, probably. Yeah, yeah. He was. He was second lieutenant. When he was shot down, uh, I was able to locate the flak battery that shot him down, and by that point in the war, they were teenagers in high school classes. And they got called out to go shoot down me and the 88 guns. And so I actually found one of the flat gunners that was in that unit, but he said he wasn't there that day. <laughs> but for years, I kept up with him and he translated uh, German documents for me. Right. He became a good friend. Wow. That's that's uh, that's that's very good. And, and as you said before, he was shot down on his third mission. Third mission. Yeah. Right. Here's, here's he doesn't his. look happy there. I've never seen a happy face on those ID cards. That's from Stalagloof 3. Uh, it gives his barracks and room number and his basic information. These cards were, act this is a copy of his card. Uh, these cards were actually a pink color. And when the men went to Mooseburg, uh, where they were eventually liberated, all these cards were taken there and they broke into the administrative office to get their cards. And that's why so many of them have them today, because they were they became souvenirs at that point. And I love this picture. That's that was his view. That was the best seat in the house as far as the view. But it was the most dangerous that and the the um, the uh, some of the some of the turrets, especially the, the uh, belly turret. I'm sorry. <laughs> turret in the bottom was a very dangerous place to be, of course, too, because as Colin knows very well, all the uh, fighters came in from the front and tried to fly through the bomber streams. And a lot of the bombardiers were killed that way. And a lot of times the bombs for the bombardiers would get caught up in the shackles um, and uh, they would take the thinnest man, which might 
on the crew and dangling on the rope in the open bomb bay to kick those bombs loose uh, so they would drop. And that was not unusual for that to happen, for the bombs to get hung up. They weren't armed yet. Sometimes they were. Uh, so <laughs> it was it was pretty dangerous, but that was his view. Uh, and he, he saw a lot of fighters come in that way. And And the same for your father, Anita, right? The navigator's desk was back. I'm sorry. Navigator's desk. Was they were right back. behind the pilots. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Close enough, but they were right next to them, right? To the bomb. Yes, and they had access to guns because my dad shot. Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. he's credited with taking down a one ninety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does that sound right, Colin? And and in your father's case, Anita, um, I. I uh, he was shot down on which mission that he flew? In his memoirs, he calls it mission 24 and three fourths because they were on their way back from the 25th mission when they were hit and he parachuted out. Wow. 25th yeah. mission. <laughs> what date was that? Uh, July 26. No, April 1944. April 44. Wow. So close. It was, he was a POW for what a, a year and four days. Right. Right. And let's see. The next shot I have here, I think, Marilyn, this was a uh, something you sent me. This is where your uh, when your father was was captured. This is where they first put him. No, 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 no. no. His, when his uh, when they had to bail out. Um, they flew over. This was a farmhouse in, in Blick, a beautiful farm community. Very, it's still beautiful. And um, there, were, I think I sent you the picture of the little girl, Gretchen, who was 10 years old, and she lived in that house. This house had a thatch roof. It was built in 1625. Wow. And she heard the noise and she ran out. She was there alone that day because her parents were at the funeral of a local German boy who had been killed. And she, the plane was on fire and it flew low over that thatched roof and almost caught it on fire. Yeah. And of course, she was terrified. Later on, it's called um, Hollendorf. Uh, it became a, a set for a TV show called um, uh, The Country Doctor that was on for years and they would film here. And when we were there, uh, she had little bot bottles of schnapps for us with the label, with the picture of, on the outside. And uh, this, I don't know much about the show. She just said that whatever was wrong with people and he couldn't cure him, he'd give them schnapps. <laughs> so <laughs> so but like, I've been there several you. times. Yeah, I, I met her. Um, she I came back and after 60 some years, um, I, I told her, you know, she knew who I was. She knew I was coming and she cried and she said, I always wondered. She watched them bail out. She watched my dad bail out. And the rest of the crew. And she said she always wondered if they made it or not. And after 60 some years, I was able to come back and tell her all but one made it. And they lived long lives. So and, it was very gratifying. And Marilyn, so your father was captured immediately. Uh, upon Yeah. The yeah. They had one dead on the ground. And that's a whole different story that I, I tell in, in my book, which is kind of interesting. But um, the rest of them were picked up fairly close together. They were held in a jail. Yeah. a local jail that night. And I've been there. I've retraced his entire footsteps. I've seen where the jail is. Um, and it, he was shot down on a Sunday and they took him near a church and he was looking out the window and saw all the people coming out of mass where he normally would have been doing that. And it was surreal for him because here it was Sunday and he's locked up in Germany near the church. Um, and um, then they went to, a castle. They were in the basement there for a while. And then they actually, after they took the dead body of their top turret gunner uh, for burial at a church. And I found that cemetery as well. Um, and uh, then they were taken to Dula Gluff for interrogation. And, and Anita, was your father captured right away uh, upon? Yes. Okay. At, but he, as he came down, he saw the guy with aiming and a rifle at him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just waiting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have Steve Snyder on tonight, who was on last week with Lucky <laughs> Lucky. And of course, Steve's father 
evaded capture was was one of the lucky ones i guess uh uh to evade capture um so overall um uh maybe let me point this to you marilyn uh, like in the episode that we saw last week egan is portrayed as uh, uh, uh evading capture at first right that eventually is captured and I, and I don't know how true that is i know it's true of many airmen but if i'm not sure it's specific to egan but he evades capture then he's put in with he's captured he's put in with a group of other pow's who are marched through a bombed out village and i did the research for that that was called the russian massacre okay. and what you see in masters of the air everything you see happened but it didn't necessarily happen to the person that you're looking at yeah and that was a case it was a horrible massacre they alluded to it a little bit as to what happened the uh the raf had bombed that area the night before actually with the canadians and uh, the next day, the Americans went down and they were taken to the train station to catch a train to go to Dulag left for interrogation. And uh, the tracks were too uh, torn up to use any trains on them. And so they had to walk down to the next train station. And that's when they ran into uh, the uh, mob, which had you could see it was devastating what happened there. And it was kind of a case of a mistaken identity because they did not do that bombing. And yet the people thought they did. And so that's yeah. how uh, Egan at that time or the people at the time um, uh, ran into such a horrible, horrible experience. Yeah. yeah. So. Do, do we have any feel for Because that, that story, I'm sure, was retold many times. I'm sure. Not always in the numbers that were shown in that, but by men by men, right, who were captured by civilians or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, other paramilitary and murdered. Or right, that. right. Do we have a feel for how many men, that, you know, were murdered in that way of those that? Well, we don't have the exact number, but I have a friend, a researcher, a friend in Germany who works with war crimes material in the archives. And uh, she would find where these atrocities happen, and then she would try and find the families. And I would help her find the families here in the U.S., and so many of them didn't have a clue that that had happened to one of their relatives. It's a very touchy thing. Yeah. Um, she would put a memorial up over there. And uh, a lot of the families that I found ended up going to join her for ceremonies over there for them. And I, one chilling thing she told me at one point is that um, when men were killed by civilians on the ground, a lot of times the telegram that went home to the family uh, said he was just killed in action. And that was it. And they had no idea how he was killed in action. And that was not terribly uncommon from what she said. So we don't know the exact number. I know, especially, and we we'll talked about Alexander Jefferson later and, and a lot of the other ones, They the thing they dreaded most when they hit the ground was to run into um, the Hitler Youth. They said they'd rather face the Gestapo than the Hitler Youth because they were so, it's the way they were from a very young age learned to hate so much and they're very cruel. You know, brainwashed, indoctrinated. They were brainwashed, yes. Oh, yeah. And uh, they gave Alex Jefferson a good scare on him when he was on a train. And he's not the only one. They they didn't like the Hitler youth. <laughs> Harry Stewart, Colonel Harry Stewart, who we've um, interviewed, um, he was a Tuskegee Airman. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping to have him on a program maybe next month. He has a chilling story about one of the Tuskegee Airmen who went down and was lynched. Oh, yes, yes. He, it, he's mm -hmm. gone back and to that village and they there's a memorial mm -hmm. for him and so forth yeah maybe i could ask colin this question colin at least in the movies and so forth when 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 our airmen uh were captured they seem to always be better off being captured by luftwaffe uh men is that accurate that's totally accurate and i'll tell you why <laughs> buddy hayden he flew with chuck yeager and bud anderson when he got shot down, he landed near Nuremberg, and Nuremberg had just been bombed. And uh, this is January 45, 
And, uh, and he was like, you know, that crowd, and it's in my book, his interview said, I'm an old Texas boy. And I saw that lynching coming and, Mm -hmm. uh, and the crowd was coming at him and they wanted a piece of him. And the guy who saved his life was a teenaged SS recruit who had orders to get him to Oberursel. That was his mission. And he fired his MP40 submachine gun into the air at the train station and said in German, said, he's with me. I'll leave him alone. You know, whatever. You know, he's my he's my responsibility. So he followed his orders and defied an entire crowd. But, yeah, the Hitler youth were pretty ruthless. In fact, I interviewed one guy who was a Hitler youth who said that he and some of his guys actually found a British airman. They think he was British. He could have been Canadian or Australian. I don't know. But uh, everybody crowded around and beat him to death with rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Pitchforks as well. Pitchforks, shovels, whatever. In fact, you know, excuse me, um, this came to mind. If you want to know what happened when um, Buck Clevin hit the ground, they don't show that. Yeah. But I know what happened to him. (laughs) He he came down and he landed near a, a farmer's house right near the front door. And he was kind of knocked out a little bit when he came to the farmer had a pitchfork just right on his chest and told him, don't move. And eventually he was taken away. But uh, there was some debate whether to show that, but they couldn't keep the suspense going, whether to, whether he lived or not when he went down, if they told the story of how he was, you know, followed him. So yeah. that, uh, a farmer could have killed him easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, any, uh, Questions or comments? I, I was going to go back to our uh, slides here. Am I, is, am I, uh, everybody seeing that? We are seeing it. And I d- I'll just invite anybody who has a question or comment, if they want to raise their hand, uh, uh, the Zoom hand, we could ask you to unmute and you could ask your question. Well, we're waiting to see. I, I I just put this picture in here because I just thought it was gorgeous, Marilyn. It is. I, I, <laughs> it's in the National Archive. I, I don't know if I've ever seen this before of a B-17 and a B-24 flying together like that. Adam Makos uh, sent, gave me that. He had gotten it at the archive who wrote A Higher Call, and Colin's well aware well aware of Adam Makos in that book for oh, a lot great. of reasons we could go into. <laughs> that's another uh, great book. That's how I found Colin, actually. Um, but the B-24 on the right, the B-17 on the left, and to this day, the children of the crews on the B-17 and the B-24 still debate which is the better plane, which the dad, our dads did in the POW camps, and even the guys who survived, they still have that big debate. Lucky, Lucky gave us the answer a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I, I bet it wasn't the B-24. <laughs> well, the, the B-24 is the box that the B-17 came in. So. <laughs> I heard him say that. I know. <laughs> Pretty player. The B-17 was the pretty plane. They always called it the pretty plane. <laughs> Anita, just a little bit on uh, back to your father's story. You sent me this uh, photo. Uh, this yeah. is uh, one of the rest homes or the flack houses. Right. After he up. was wounded, they, he was treated and sent to the flack house. And this was his first wound his first purple heart um stayed there and was treated and rested and they had to um i'm trying to remember how he said talk to very sternly to return to battle he'd done five missions he'd been wounded he he said they brought him hot cocoa in bed when he was recuperating. Yeah. 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 A- a- again, in the episode last week, the most recent episode that aired, the, the, it, some of it is set at a flag house and the, the scenes where Rosie Rosenthal sits with the psychologist, I think that they had there both in his office and then a more casual scene, I think are just incredibly well done. And you got to take your hand, ha- ha- your hat off to John Orloff for the scripting there. Uh, it, it, he just did a beautiful job of explaining, um, again, why they were there, why, you know, Rosie Rosenthal had the attitude. He didn't want to be there. The psychologist comes back at him, I think, with a great answer. It's not just for you. It's for your crew. too. Uh, so 
uh, again, encourage you to watch that. Um, Todd, were, were there any questions or should I just keep moving along here? Okay. It, this may be hard to read, but I, it just hits me. And I, and I saw your version of this as well, um, Marilyn. This was the telegram that um, uh, the fa the, uh, Anita's father's family uh, uh, received from, about Danny M. Christ. And to me, it's just so stark. Uh, with Steve Snyder, we had that same discussion with you last week about your mother's reaction to getting the telegram. It basically, you know, sorry to tell you, your son's been reported missing in action on such and such date over Germany. And we really don't know anymore. And we'll get back to you if we do know more. And I just I noticed they got it three weeks later. Yeah. Yeah. And I just can't imagine the chill that would go through a person a loved one receiving that um, i still have my grandfather my grandmother's receipt her western union from my when my grandfather was killed in uh, 44 yeah. that i still have that along with all the letters he wrote and it is very similar to this it simply says regret to inform you your husband first lieutenant charles harris has been killed in action you know that's all it says i mean there's no explanation of course yeah yeah in, in uh, uh, Marilyn and I, we, we were talking last night about that book by uh, Professor Childers. Uh, what's the name of it, Marilyn? Uh, Wings, um, Wings of Morning. Wings of Morning. Mm -hmm. And in there, he goes into great detail about after the telegrams were received by the family members of all the crew, of all the um, uh, back and forth information, telephone calls and further telegrams among those family members. Mm -hmm. trying to exchange information and figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. and That's true. That's very true. To, to, to a fairly futile reality that they just couldn't get any more information. Mm -hmm. Someone has asked how the telegram would be delivered. If it was personally, it was personal. As far mm -hmm. as I know, uh, someone came to the door with it and dropped it off and delivered it. What was it a Western Union delivery person? Western Union, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think starting with Vietnam, I, I think weren't the telegrams delivered by an officer um, of that service? Brad Washbaugh, do you do you know uh, what what the practice is today or has been in the last twenty or thirty years? Maybe Brad's not on. Does I don't anybody... think they did telegrams later. They came to the door. The officials came to the door to give the news. Usually had clergy with them. Yeah. And there were two or three that came to the door. If I could jump in, Glenn, um, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And telegrams were still used in Vietnam until the I Drang Valley, where it, the first major uh, conflict in the Vietnam War and so many from the first air cav were killed that they realized that this couldn't go on. It had to be more personal. And after that, they did go ahead and send a chaplain and also somebody, usually a, an officer from one of the uh, ROTC schools or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Todd, uh, Glenn, I'm here. If I can say what. Brad, let Brad go first. Go ahead. And your question was, I just joined uh, just joined a couple of minutes ago, but uh, there's a casualty assistance officer assigned for each each mm. casualty, and uh, they make a personal visit, and they have somebody that stays with that family throughout the process. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. When I was on active duty, I did escort. Yeah, I did escort on active duty and casualty assistance. In my unit, when I was in the Army before the Corps, I was in the 101st Airborne. We had the Gander crash that killed 248. And uh, wow. the only people who would make the notifications were from that regiment, preferably the survivors of that battalion who were already back. And it would be a commissioned officer, a chaplain, and generally an enlisted man who was friends with the family if he was alive. That's the way they did it. And uh, they tried to make it like like the colonel said, they tried to make it more personable. And uh, and I was on the I was with the team that went to see my friend Jerry Malone and his wife was pregnant with two kids already. And oh. she had a miscarriage when she heard. So but I knew the family. I'd been with him in Germany. So they said, you're coming with us. You know, the family. And I'm like, I really don't want to do this. 
but but I did, you know. So yeah, but it became more personal. Yeah. Well, let's let's move on. That's uh, obviously a very difficult. So I this sketch, uh, Marilyn, you 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 sent me, uh, and very apropos given the episode, uh, the most recent episode. These are the POWs arriving at the camp. Right, and that was done by Lee Kenyon, who was a British POW and a fantastic artist. And uh, after the war, he decided he didn't want to go into art as a career, and he uh, sailed with Jacques Cousteau instead oh. and scuba dived. And he taught uh, Prince Philip how to how to scuba dive in the Buckingham Palace pool. <laughs> so just as an aside. Sounds like a talented uh, man. <laughs> yeah, he really was. His art is unbelievable. This is a um exactly the way it did look there were two big gates there what you don't see through that gate is a big flagpole with a huge uh nazi flag on it and we were very fortunate when we were working on masters of the air and i mentioned my good friend merrick lazars who's uh the head of the stalag Three museum in zagan uh, poland now and um, this was just an incredible story. We were able for the set to tell them exactly what everything looked like. I had tons of pictures. We knew the measurements. What you see uh, uh, during the, the series when they go to the camp is that the barbed wire is the exact gauge. It was the actual barbed wire that they used. The post, uh, all the wooding. Yeah, there, there's a bigger picture of it. That's walking the circuit. Um, and um, everything is to scale. And we had a few questions about the front gate and a friend of Merrick's in Germany went to an auction. It was um, someone had died in this house. He wasn't sure who it turned about, turned out to be the uh, architect of Stalag Lou three with all the original architectural plans, all the measurements, everything. And for the first time we got the angle of the front gate that we wanted to see just how it was. We kind of knew where the flag post was, but it confirmed so we were just, it was just a miracle. And I, I called, uh, I let Kirk know and John Orloff and um, tell them for the first time there, I, we've never seen pictures of that front gate. There's pictures of, taken in the camp, but never the front gate. So they were just giddy when they went out to the set um, and they called me from the UK and they said, oh, I wish you could be here with us and see this. I mean, he said, it looks identical and it will, what you see will be what the prisoner saw well that scene at the end of the last episode when buck is moved is bucky i guess is is mm -hmm. in the camp with the others and then he finds yeah. buck and then they show the bigger camp it's just stunning what they it is it, it the set itself was one of the sets usually for a lot of movies aren't that big this one is fairly big but you are seeing some computer gener generated imaging in the back yeah. Uh, the set did not go clear back that far. It looks very authentic um, because you see so much of it, but way in the back, if you look closely, that's computer generated. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's, uh, the, the barracks look identical. Everything you see from here on out, the cookhouse will come into play later on. That's identical as well. Everything. And they wanted it authentic. And I have to say it is. Let, let me take a step back now in the sort of chronology of the story. So, Flyers shot down, most of them captured pretty quickly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then to answer the question that uh, Todd, someone had before that I put off about the interrogation and the interrogation scene that we saw in the last episode, how did those? How did that go? Uh, did they interrogate the officers more closely than the enlisted men? How did they know so much about the men? Um. When they were shot down, the Luftgau were local units and the local, wherever the plane went down, they would go and um, check on the crew, check on the plane. They were in charge. They would take the information, anything that was left on the plane, things that men weren't supposed to carry in their pockets. For instance, they might have pay books, uh, mess tickets, theater tickets, driver's license, social security card. They weren't supposed to fly with those, but a lot of them tended to do that. And uh, when they, all that was confiscated and then they were, they were put on a train and they were taken to Oberussel to do La Glove for interrogation. And they got there and there is a big building. I sent it to, uh, to Kirk. Uh, it was called Buna, B-U-N-A. I forget the German, what that translates to, but it was just like a big 
almost like a flea market, <laughs> files everywhere. And that's where they kept all the things that uh, could serve uh, a purpose when they did the interrogations. And a lot of times the men had their picture taken in for an escape picture and different uh, different bomb groups would use maybe the same shirt and tie on every man. So once they saw one of those, every time somebody came in and had that same thing, they knew exactly what bomb group it was with. Uh, there was talk, some spies in in um, the UK, uh, they, they did have some German spies there and some of it came from, but a lot of it was just uh, clippings from home. When a man got through the service, the parents would put this in the paper. So everything was there and they had a clipping service that clipped all kinds of newspaper articles that they used. Um, sometimes a person might um, one of the men might have a meal ticket with a, a check mark for every meal that he got. And there was, if somebody used a really dull pencil at one of the bomb groups. So every time they saw that dull mark, that's how they do it. So they were really ingenious in how they did that. They were really good at what they did. And th that was the shock to the people that, the men that got there. And, uh, it just really set them back and think, boy, if they know this much about me, this war is not going our way. <laughs> Anita, did, did your father have anything to say about his interrogation? Yes. And on that last flight, he was wearing a prototype of a new electric uh, warming suit. And it, he calls it wool olive green. And for some reasons, he did not wear his dog tags. So when he came down... He thought, they're going to think I'm a spy. I'm dressed like it. This is it. It wasn't, luckily. Um, they did use that when the, in his first interrogation. And he was amazed at what they already knew about him. They told him how many DFCs he'd done, how many flights he'd been on. Uh, after the initial one, he was put in a room with one other guy. Neither one spoke at all. At one point, he was put into a room with a number of supposed American airmen, and no one spoke the whole time. They had infiltrators sometimes. They would, yes, they would and, and mm -hmm. vividly portrayed the, in the episode before where uh, the resistance ferrets out oh, who was the infiltra infiltrator and shoot shoots them. Uh, yeah. Do you know why that did have, they weren't real clear on that. Do you know how they knew he was an infiltrator? I caught it. <laughs> I know Colin knows. <laughs> <laughs> they asked him to fill out the, the uh, questionnaires in Bob. That was his name, right, Colin? Bob, yeah. uh, Bob wrote that he said, write the date on the top of the paper. The guy wrote the yeah. date, up, but he wrote it the European way. Anyway. They wrote it reversed of what we do. And then with the cigarette, <laughs> Colin, you want to pick up from the cigarette and knives and forks and all that? <laughs> yeah, he held it. He held it with the, the finger and the, the, the index finger and the thumb, and which smoking. is like a, a very European way of smoking a cigarette, unlike Americans. Yeah. And yeah. when you pull it out like that, it's an indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um. Yeah. Colin, what, what was the name of the book you got? Both of you mentioned it to me that is so good about interrogate the interrogator, the interrogator. By, yeah. by by Ray uh, Tolliver. That's Tolliver. Colin's friend, Ray Tolliver. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was Colonel Colonel Ray Tolliver. He was a fighter pilot during the war. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a great book. But they even uh the ones that went down in France, the er escapers with the comet line that went through Belgium and then into France, the resistance people warned them, if you're in a restaurant, don't hold your knife this way or that way. They don't do it that way in France. And so many a downed airman had been taken away because they held their knife or fork the wrong way. The resistance people were really good at what they did. Sure. Yeah, that's why Bill Donovan hired Julia Child to train the OSS operatives how to properly yeah. dine in the European fashion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let, let's go back to a few more slides. So Stalag Luft three, one of the most famous of the of of the prisoner of war camps. I think this was something Anita you sent me. You sent me several photos or clippings, and 
obviously these men had to entertain themselves. They had to have a life every day. I mean, imagine it was incredibly boring <laughs> in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, each compound had a theater, and uh, a lot of the big bands at the at the time, um, some of their members were in the war, and uh, they ended up as prisoners of war. So the musical entertainment at Stalin Glue Three was incredible because they had so many professional musicians there. And I know when they were on the march later, there was one of them. He played the trumpet, and he took his trumpet with him. And when they felt they couldn't go on anymore. He took out his trumpet and he played When Johnny Comes Marching Home Again. And it just roused their spirits to make them go on after that. So yeah, they had a lot. This The theater entertainment was just unbelievable in the theater. All the different theaters, they plays and comedies. And uh, at Christmas, they had um, the Messiah and the German guards stood out because they loved even classical music. And at Christmas, they were away from home, too. There's one of the guards there. And they looked through, they, even the Germans, the commandant would go to the performances in the theater. Unfortunately, you won't see this theater. That was one of the things they had to cut out because there were so many stories that came from the theaters. Um, but there's just no time to include it. That was sad when they had to cut that. We were really debated. I thought this, this photo you sent me, uh, Marilyn, was just such a great human interest study. I mean, because it's clandestine camera. <laughs> And Americans yeah. and Germans, and looks like they're chatting it up about. Oh, they are. Yeah, I know. I know who that guard is, and they had some guards that were their favorites. Um, and this picture was taken from the upstairs in one of the barracks. There weren't really much but an attic up there, and they had a lot of clandestine cameras. And uh, th this is one of the pictures that was taken. But the Germans also took pictures of them. There's General Clark in the background. He was Lieutenant Colonel there. Um, and um, that was a picture taken by the Germans. This was taken by a clandestine camera. This is roll call called Appel. And it was um, twice a day. And it, this is before they actually marched out. I, this, this is probably South Compound. Um, but after a while, when they got uniforms from home, they put on their uh, uniforms and marched out in formation to be counted. So give us some numbers here. How many prisoners eventually in American prisoners in Stalaglyph 3? And help, help us understand Stalaglyph 3 is uh, divided into compounds. Some of one, some compounds are American and another compound is for British. Is, could you explain that for us? It started with East Compound very early in the war. Uh, and those are mostly British. And as more of the RAF got shot down early in the war, they went to North Compound. Um, some men from East also went over to North. And the people like, or the men like Clark, who went down very early in the war, he was the very first American fighter pilot shot down in Europe because he was flying with the RAF. He flew Spitfires, was shot down over the English Channel. Well, there he is. <laughs> He's a very good friend. Um, I still miss him. He's um, He... Uh, not another incredibly handsome young man. Yes, he was. Yeah. You'll see him maybe starting the next episode on. That's his plane that was shot down. He got disoriented because they were chasing the fighters or chasing him across the English Channel. And um, the bullets, he was down so low, the bullets were hitting the water. And he knew he had to get out of the plane because that plane was going to sink in the channel. And by the way, the channel is loaded with planes on the bottom. If you ever dredge the channel, it's loaded with planes. Um, yeah. But um, he went to pull the canopy and the handle came off in his hand. And so then he was really panicked. So he thought he took, tried to get the plane back up again. And he got disoriented and thought he, la he landed on the British side of the channel, but he was on the French side instead. And he crash landed and then he was their prisoner. And the pilot that shot him down introduced him to the other pilots uh, later on and they all went out to dinner and uh, it's it's very strange sometimes there's a camaraderie between pilots it doesn't matter which side they're on <laughs> yeah. and uh, they asked him a lot of questions but uh, he later became uh, superintendent of the Air Force Academy years later it's important and, to see him in the uh, in the episode uh, I'm sorry I'm looking forward to seeing him portrayed in oh yeah yeah I've seen a picture of the actor that portrays him he was kind of Irish, looked with reddish hair, very tall, blue eyes. 
And he was in North, North Compound with the British. But when the Commandant realized the tunnel was going to break, uh, you see Tunnel Harry up there. Um, by the way, this picture, a lot of people don't see the comment on the bottom. that They think this is all Stalag Blue 3, but it's not. It's uh, Stalag 8C, which was a French work camp that was there before Stalag Blue 3. So it's just that right part that's Stalag Blue 3. And even there, South Compound hasn't been built yet. So this is a very early reconnaissance picture. And, uh, and he's the one responsible for the the special collections, right? At the Air Force Academy? Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah, his scrapbook is out there. Yeah. I need a, 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 to research out there is wonderful because they have the biggest collection of Stalag Glue 3 material um, out there. And uh, it's a great, I was, went out there a couple of times. In fact, I went out there the second time I went out there. He said to me, um, he said, Marilyn, he said, do you ever knew, did you find out, could you find out what happened to Lieutenant Sconyers? And I knew the name and I knew he had died in camp. And I said, I don't know, but I'll try and find out. And because he, Sconyers was also in North Compound, he worked for, in security for Tunnel Harry. Um, one of the Doolittle Raiders, you know, none of them escaped through the tower, but they helped with it in security. And one, Davy Jones helped dig the, the tunnel, Tunnel Harry. But anyway, he asked me, I said, I'd find out. And it took me 16 years, but I did find Lieutenant Scott, you're buried in Poland, and we brought him back to Florida and buried him 60-some um, years next to his mother, who didn't really know exactly what happened to him after the war. And a documentary was made, and it won first place at the in D-Day at the uh, 75th anniversary and um, beat out 50 other films. So it's a fantastic story. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. It's very good. Yeah, yeah, Colin saw it. Yeah, it was it was the Band of Brothers actors actually presented the award for it uh, at DJ in Normandy. They go back every year. So, so help, it, us, help us understand the story of the Great Escape in less than three hours. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to start? <laughs> Roger Bushel so, headed the Germans. <laughs> so the movie, of course, is. I have it memorized. I'm sure most people do. Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, uh, it, 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 it takes place from the British part of Stalag Luft Three. Right, that's North Compound, right where you see that arrow where it says Harry. That's the tunnel right there. That's where they came up short going into the woods. And um, uh, now that's overgrown somewhat there too. But at the time... You this, can see this is a very early picture of, by the way, there's much better pictures. Um, uh, it's all filled in. All the names are on it. And there's a big memorial at the end, right at the woods where they did come up. And this um, this is a really interesting one. Do you want me to tell this story, Glenn? I mentioned it to you. This is the. Well, first, tell, tell us how many prisoners escaped. 76 went out, but there were a couple more that got out when. The Germans discovered what was going on and the whistles were blowing and the dogs were barking and they went back in. So they're not officially counted. At least two of them uh, went back in. So some people say 78, but 76 got out. 50 and core shot. Were there any Americans in that 76? No. No. The British don't like us to say there were Americans in that <laughs> because none went out through the tunnel. I always thought Jim Garner made it. I no, no. If you ask the British, they'll tell you for sure he didn't make it. <laughs> and, uh, but and this the, is a vault. The RAF let them build um, the, the RAF. Uh, this was actually in April. The weather warmed up some, and they were allowed outside the camp to get these white stones. And it is a vault. And after uh, all the urns came back of the ashes of the cremated 50, they were put into this vault. And... Bushels was one of the last one that was put in from what I understand the way the story goes. And when the men were evacuated, the whole camp was evacuated in January of 1945, the, because the Russians were coming in from the east. The Russians were fascinated with this structure and they got inside it because they thought money or jewels might be hidden in it. And they knocked over a couple of the urns, but particularly it happened to be Bushels where the ashes spilled out. So later, when all the urns were taken out and the men were buried in Poznan, Poland, at the cemetery there, the one that remained behind was Roger Bushel, the one who wanted to get out of the camp the most because yeah. he hated it there. 
So it's just kind of an irony. And that eagle that you see on the front, the Russians stole that eagle malaria there as well. But it's still there. That's still in the camp. You go back to the camp, you can see it. It's still there. And, and always flowers on it, memorials. And, and Colin, and, we were speaking last night. You, you, you had something really interesting to say about uh, how the order came down to shoot the 50, how they were picked or who, who made that order. Give us the background. A lot of people think that Hitler gave the order to execute them. That's not true. The order came from Heinrich Himmler. Himmler told, Ger told uh, Heinrich Mueller, head of the Gestapo, when they found out those guys were gone, Himmler told Carl Wolf, he goes, he goes, Wolf, I know who the hell is in that group of people. And I know Bush was one of them. And because uh, he'd already escaped and, and tried to escape and he was already well known. So the great escape artist, as Marilyn knows, were thrown into the same camp, which was a bad idea. Yeah. And uh, so Himmler issued the order to Heinrich Mueller that uh, once captured, they were, to be made an, they were to be made an example of. And uh, and that's how it happened. I mean, he issued the order and he, and they, they were killed. So the movie, The Great Escape, uh, other than Jim Gardner and Steve McQueen, which I know are all made up characters, the, the fundamentals of the movie and the tunnel digging and the escape and so forth are fairly accurate. Pretty accurate. Uh, but bear in mind, the movie has it wrong when it shows them all gathered up and machine gunned down. They oh. were killed together. They were killed individually as they were captured. They were just executed. They weren't gathered in one group. Usually two at a time. They took them out to the side of the road and shot them. Yeah. Shot them in the back of the head. Bushel they shot once and they, he didn't die right at first and they had to shoot him again. Wow. Um, and yeah, it, it's it comes right. It, there were a lot of things in the in the uh, show that were uh, true, but they had some license they took as well and um uh, particularly with putting the americans there and anything that steve mcqueen did <laughs> like riding the motorcycle never happened they used composite characters whereas masters of the air did not want to do that so all the names that you hear in masters of the air are names of the real people every one of them they didn't uh no composites in this one which i like i'm glad they did that i wish they would have done that in the great escape what was the date of the great escape March 24th, was it 24th, 1944? 44, yeah. And my so, dad was there in April. Yeah. About the 24th, <laughs> like a month later. Month yeah, later. my co-author's dad got there that day, as well as Irv Baum. I sent you the the, the Jewish um, prisoner, that card. Uh, they both got there the day of it. the tunnel had broken during the early morning hours and they got there that day and it was just chaos in the camp. And that's one of the few times that Gestapo was in the camp had come over from Breslau uh, or the SS. And normally they weren't there, uh, but they were that day when the tunnel broke. And then one more question, Todd, that I'm going to ask, unless anybody else has some, we probably ought to take our station break, but uh, 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 Marilyn, were you are you aware of any significant breakouts from the American side of the compound? Was there a great escape American? They were always digging tunnels. There were over a hundred tunnels dug at Stalingrad three. Oh, wow. but <laughs> uh, I've seen a map where one of the prisoners wore. He was marking a lot of them, but they didn't amount to anything. A few people got out from time to time, but they were usually captured. And it was so close to the end of the war. And really, they knew that the Germans were losing the war. They didn't want to risk their lives by tunneling out. And if the Germans did find tunnels, they either flooded them or they ran great big heavy trucks over them. And at one point, they tried to blow one up and use too much dynamite. And <laughs> they really blew it up. The roof came off. So no, nothing, nothing significant, I would say. Todd, uh, I, I see Don Patton waving his hand. You want to unmute Don, uh, Don and then go to the station break? Let's do that. Yeah. And, and I'll just say I'm in awe of the expertise and the knowledge of our guests tonight, but also of other people here in the Zoom room who are putting such great recommendations and insights in the chat. Uh, so thank you all for, for adding to it. It actually gives me the idea of maybe posting some of the chat some of the uh, zoom chat comments on our website don Patton, how are you don great sir uh just just a quick question uh kind of off the topic but did uh, marilyn and anita's uh, fathers ever 
ever watch Hogan's Heroes and comment on it. <laughs> yes. Loved it. My dad he loved, loved it too. <laughs> that show. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Bobby, Plank. <laughs> if, if you hold we on, bought, I remember watching it with him. Yeah. If you hold on just about five more minutes, Don, we're going to get the Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> Marilyn <laughs> has a piece about it that I I was stunned to see. Totally. Don, that is such a great question. And Don, I know I owe you a phone call. I'll be calling you tomorrow. Uh, hopefully you'll be available. Hey, I just want to remind people, this is the Veterans Breakfast Club. You can check out what we do at veteransbreakfastclub.org. We have programs like this twice a week. Our next one will be on Monday night, March 4th. We'll be celebrating Women's History Month with these three remarkable veterans, all of whom played a crucial role in getting uh, women to be able to serve in combat. And we want to talk about what motivated them the struggle that they took on, and of course, their own service and insights. This will be Monday night, March 4th, 7 p.m. Eastern. We do hope you join us. We always have something new. We're always looking to talk with veterans of all eras, all ages, all branches of service, whether they like the service or not. <laughs> whatever the story they have, whatever job they did, we do want to hear about it because our mission is to connect, educate, heal, and inspire and we also are very grateful to our sponsors, Tobacco Free Adagio Health. Tobacco Free Adagio Health is dedicated to preventing and reducing tobacco use, educating people about the hazards of tobacco and vaping, and advocating for healthier places to live, work, and play. You can find out more about what they do at tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. That's tobaccofree.adagiohealth.org. Um, and we're also grateful for UPMC for Life, which sponsors just about everything that we do. Uh, we're very grateful for their support. They do help make these programs possible. And what they can do is help you make sense of Medicare, get the answers and information you need, such as how to choose the Medicare Advantage plan that's right for you. UPMC for Life has plans designed for veterans by veterans that can save you money and get you benefits. You can learn more at upmchealthplan.com slash Medicare. Uh, I do want to let people know that uh, we the magazine is in print it's going to be sent out to 9,000 plus households uh, by Monday at the latest. And we will also print up another 8,000 to distribute by hand. Anybody who wants a box or wants one, just let me know. Send me an email at todd, T-O-D-D, at veteransbreakfastclub.org. It's a free magazine. We write up the stories that we hear at the Veterans Breakfast Club and send it out on a quarterly basis uh, and I also ask that people, if you're interested in our programming and you have a strong opinion about how it's going, how we're doing, what we can do better, what we can improve upon, please let us know by taking this two and a half minute survey. I will put the this link here in the chat and uh, and you can let us know how we're doing. All right. Thank you very much for that time. I see that we do have quite a few comments, interesting comments in the chat here. Uh, Jim Blakely. You had a question. Jim asks, tell us about your interactions with the Masters of Air people. Was it by phone or Zoom? Tell us what Orloff changed due to your consultation. Uh, did you go to the POW set? He put that in the chat. Yeah. They were all, this is all in the UK and it was COVID and that affected the production as well. I did not go over there. Um, I, I was filmed in DC uh, after the ninth episode that same night, there'll be a documentary on how uh, Masters of the Air was made and the people involved in it. And I was just one of them. And they're going to show that that same night. Uh, my communication with John Orloff early on, uh, the first time he called me, um, he said, here's the problem we're having. We have no idea what POWs do, did all day. And I, I kind of thought for a minute and I thinking out loud and I said well John I said first of all they were really bored which in some ways they were not all the time and there was this pause and he said that Marilyn boredom doesn't sell <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said no they did a lot they tunneled they dug they had theaters and whatever so um, my communication with him was um, always uh, pretty much on the phone uh, Kirk I saw in person a few times but um uh, we talked on the phone as well. And uh, I had my computer on the whole time when they were filming in the UK because a question would come up and all of a sudden I, I've got hundreds of books here with post-it notes just like he's got. And I was trying to think where the answer was. 
And uh, sometimes they wanted to know something right now. And, and sometimes it could wait. It depended. <laughs> and so it kept us on our toes. And like I say, my friend in America, in Poland, was very helpful as well. And uh, usually between between us, we could figure out what they wanted. Like obscure things. When you see the desk uh, in the interrogation office, they say, what did he have on his desk? What colors were the papers? And even if you see random German documents, those documents were authentic. Uh, somebody found it in an archive. It wasn't a fake piece of paper. They wrote something on everything. And I, they wanted to know what kind of telephones were on there and the pen. And I saw in the last episode, they had the picture. The, I sent them a picture of the pen and they want to know what kind of cigarettes and they had everything. So it's all really authentic. So mm. I would say mostly that was email and phone calls. Colin, your, your interaction with... Uh... The program with the producers well my first interaction was marilyn calling me saying hey i think i got you a job <laughs> <laughs> she, nice friend to have worked out great <laughs> yeah she said yeah this girl jess bradbury in london's uh, needing somebody as a luftwaffe expert and found out they'd hired three people who had been working for three months who came up with less than three months than i had on my computer <laughs> and uh so i sent her some info so Jess called me from London and says, can you do a Zoom? Did a Zoom. We did a Zoom. And after 10 minutes, she goes, you're hired. <laughs> and uh, then I sent her some stuff and I said, see if this interests you. And then from that point forward, it was every three, well, not every, three or four times a week. They'd send me pictures and they'd say, what is this? Who is this? What does this mean? What does that mean? So I finally said, let me just give you everything in the cosmic world of Carl Sagan. So I'd, and, and one tenth of what I had, I sent to Glenn as an example of all the research I did. Uh, and a... uh, so I sent her hundreds of emails with thousands of pages of stuff. And I said, if you have any, if you guys have any questions, give me a call, but this should settle the issue. And they still called. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're going to have Colin on, by the way, in a future program to talk about the air war over Europe from Europe from the Luftwaffe point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that would be fascinating with college knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think so, when, when you saw the gates in the last episode with the signs, this is one thing that I picked up on. Those signs, should, those are the ones I said, don't use those signs. They weren't, they were on, they weren't on the gates and they were, <laughs> those are signs normally that Scapa would use in a train station uh, as a checkpoint when you had to show your papers, but they weren't on prisoner war camp. So that's one thing I said, no. I shouldn't have been there. <laughs> that wasn't authentic. Before we jump back to the ending, because the ending of the story of the POWs is fascinating in itself. And I got to answer Don's questions about Hogan's heroes, because I had the same question, Don, of Marilyn and, and uh, <laughs> of, of our panel here. But before we get there, let me just recognize Robert Matson and Steve Snyder. You're both on tonight. They've both been uh, so kind in uh, previous episodes, and they come on now and then. And any comments from from either one of you about either the uh, Apple TV series and the last couple of programs, or anything that we've talked about tonight? Well, I I, I think this last episode was really good because up until this point, there wasn't much character development. And we got to know the guys a little bit better. Uh, like a band of brothers, you got to know those guys. And up until this point, you really haven't. You know, they, they, there's there's a lot of crews. There's a lot of guys, a lot of airmen. When they're in the plane, they got their masks on. Um, but now I, I think that, that that was very good. Helps not to have any mask on when the character <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Robert? Nobody anticipated that was going to happen. You couldn't hear what they were saying because of the mass. Well, yeah. One, a friend of mine says she she puts the subtitles on. A lot of people do. I've heard yeah, from so, so many people. They said, yeah, so, so that helps. Them. Yeah. Robert, any thoughts? Well, yeah, I, I was really struck uh, with the, the scene of the down flyers being murdered because it's like, yes, show that. That happened. Uh, that was one thing. Um, and when, see, I, I stepped away from World War II, uh, the air war, to do some other projects. So I never read Masters of the Air. So when Bucky saw Buck, I cried. I mean, it was so emotional for me. Buck's alive. I can't believe it. Um, and the only other thing I have to contribute is that, so I believe that the, the lower third said that it was October 1943 when Bucky made it to Stalag Book 3. 
And I just wanted to say that one month later is when Jim landed at Tibbenham, Jim Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, landed at Tibbenham and started his part in the air war. So, I mean, like, so this is setting the scenes for that whole little story of Jim's 12 really hard missions up to Big Wheat. Uh, and so that's just a little bit of perspective on the Jimmy Stewart angle. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Glenn, I asked uh, John Stulil to unmute. I think John is uh, with us maybe for the first time. He put in the chat that his father was a pilot in the 303rd bomb group. And uh, he said he told me that Hitler decreed that all terror flyers who were shot down would, and captured should be executed on the spot. And that that had a chilling effect on the air crews uh, in England. And I know Colin responded to it. John, uh, your father talked about that, huh? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I'm uh, from Minnesota. Yep, we can hear you. First of all, I want to shout out to Don Patton. Hi, Don. Anyway, yes, my father was a pilot with the 303rd Bomb Group, and I don't remember exactly when it was that Hitler decreed that all shut down uh, air crews, which they called terror flyers, would be executed on the spot. And my dad heard that. He said, oh, geez, it's bad enough flying at 25,000 feet in just ice cold conditions. And then realize if you get shot down, um, you'd probably be executed on the spot. And I guess rumors came back to how some of the airmen were, were murdered by um German citizens, they were either um, killed with pitchforks or shot outright with shotguns. And so the word came, got back to the American crews in England. If you get shot down and you find uh, the Luftwaffe, the Gestapo, get arrested by them rather than the German citizens. Sure. Yeah. 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 In fact, that's true. Uh, Johannes Steinhoff, my friend, who is a very famous fighter pilot and NATO general, he actually had to pull his weapon and threaten to kill people in a crowd when a British crew crashed and they were dead, but they were going to pull the bodies out, not knowing who was dead or alive. And he threatened to shoot them. And Heinrich Baer did the same thing when the B-17 crashed. The crew were, were still alive and they were injured. I think all survived. And I had a picture of him with the B-17, but the, the, the crowd was going to come and lynch him. And Heinrich Baer, Colonel Baer, pulled out his pistol, fired it in the air. He said, I'll kill the first son of a bitch who tries to hurt these people. They're my prisoners. So, And some of those guards were killed trying to defend the prisoners, especially yep. in Frankfurt uh, at the air, at the train station there. Frankfurt, uh, some were hanged in that area. And that was they all had to go through Frankfurt to get to Oberussel. Yeah, that's why Buddy Hayden said he saw the lynching coming. So. Mm -hmm. I knew one man who actually had the rope around his neck, uh, one of the POWs, and he got away. And uh, he told me about it, too. Well, John, thank you. Let, let me uh, jump in here because we're, we're getting towards the end. And I and I want to uh, I, I want to get the last part of the story in because it's so compelling. This is a, a shot uh, that Marilyn, you sent me. It's obviously some sort of uh, museum. Right. Pat Air Force Base. At, at Pat Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And, and what I wanted to get to, it's the end of the war, near the end of the war. The Allies are coming closer and closer to the camps. And the Germans begin to take these prisoners out of Stalag III, and, and they go on these marches. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that's what they're tr starting to portray here. I have some other shots. I'm going to jump through. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump through that one. This, uh, Marilyn, is the sign for Stalag 7A. At 7A, yeah. If you see the tower, keep an eye on that tower because it will show up in Masters of the Air. <laughs> there it is. There it is there. That's oh. the entrance in that building on the right. When I was there some years ago was a daycare center. And a lot of the other barracks were turned into low-income uh, housing. And German prisoners lived in there after the war. And uh, most of it's gone now. There's just three barracks left that we're trying to save. Um, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> but give give us a quick summary of what happened. Your father, Anita's father, all these prisoners, tens of thousands of them, are mar ten thousand marched out in January of 1945, and they marched out by compound. South Punk compound went first. They marched 52 miles in the coldest winter on record. Um, in Germany in 50 years. And um, the Germans didn't have a clue sometimes which way they were going. It was so last minute. They could last minute, they said, just pack up, we're going. And um, I've been on that march. Some of us went back, uh, our fathers, to pay tribute to our fathers. In 2009, we went back and did the march. 
Um, and they were working on co cobblestones through forests, little small villages, until they got to Sprenberg. And that's where they got on the 48 boxcars. And the 48 boxcars that you saw there were actually World War I boxcars. Um, uh, they were French cars. And as we mentioned the other night, every state after the war in the United States got one of these boxcars that was shipped over from the French full of presents. And if you go, there's a website, you can look and see where the boxcar is in your, in your state. But these were uh, say, uh, 40 men or eight horses. And when they pulled up at the platform, which is no longer, they torn it down. It, the, the train station is still there. You have a picture of that. But the loading platform isn't there anymore in Spremberg. And that's where they got on the boxcars. And they would put about 60 guards or 60 prisoners in one guard in each boxcar. And they hadn't, they had just taken cattle out. And they hadn't even cleaned out the cars when they took the cattle out, uh, any of the livestock. And they were on them for three three days and actually four nights on the boxcars and stopping just periodically. And I don't know if John Orloff decided to show this scene or not, but it's one that all the prisoners of war remembered when they got to uh, Regensburg, which was not too far from this camp where they were headed. Um, they let 10,000 men out. Eventually, as they came through there, they weren't all right at the same time. Uh, at a very nice train station there because there was no bathroom on the boxcar. There was just a bucket in the corner. And they they took the men out and gave them so much time to use the fields around there and right at the, the train station is their bathroom. And all of the prisoners of war that I talked to after the war said the site they never could ever forget was all the bare bottoms as far as you could see all the way down the train track. <laughs> so, And that was in Regensburg. Um, and when, you know, the hundreds did bomb Regensburg one time too, but they all talked about that after the year. So I don't know. My, dad, <clears throat> my dad talked about there was only room for half of the men in the boxcar just to sit at a wow. time. Oh. So they would alternate standing and sitting. Mm -hmm. And he made a comment about, when someone was sick or had diarrhea, mm -hmm. trying to make it to the bucket in the back corner was all but impossible. And that yeah, the conditions were horrid. My dad said that actually the boxcars were worse than the March. If you had to pick between the two, he would have picked Ooh. the March. That's how bad it was. Um, and so, yeah, and, but this is Mooseburg and they came into... Um, it's sad too. I know with my dad when he got there, it was on his birthday actually the day before. Um, uh, they didn't let them out that night because they had no place to put them. This camp was meant for several thousand prisoners of war early in the war, and at the end of the war, it held 120,000 men of all nationalities. And here's a good example of what it looked like. Uh, this was taken after liberation. It was absolutely filthy. The living conditions they had fleas they had bed bugs uh uh dysentery it, it was if it wasn't for the red cross getting parcels to them from time to time i don't think they would have made it and this so, this is one of my favorites <laughs> what a picture this is yeah. the famous uh task force sent by Patton. This is the this is the tank that came through and knocked down the barbed wire. That gate that I showed you. This is actually far further down. If you look in the distance to the left on the horizon, that's the top of the cheese factory, and there were SS snipers up there that were holding out on that cheese factory, and also the the uh, church steeples of Saint Castellus, and right next to the camp. But the first camp came through, um, and that was Patton's third. Uh, uh, third army and they were nicknamed the liberators and they pushed and of course all these men just went crazy um in the camp and that other picture of the tank i think i sent you where they're you don't even know a tank's under there they're they're covered the tank this is the surrender of the camp this is uh uh stalag three's um adjutant to uh the commandant von lindiner his name was zimmelite and he actually surrendered the camp uh, because von Lindeiner had already been taken away after the great escape. But this is the actual surrender. And that that's probably my favorite picture. Yeah. And um, I actually, I've had recognized some POWs that I know recognize themselves in that picture. And uh, the guys right on the left is Clark, who you'll see in Masters of the Air. Um, that's him right there. 
And I, as I mentioned, he became superintendent of the um, Air Force Academy. The man on the right on the other side uh, became a uh, commandant of cadets at the same time. So they knew each other for a long time after the war as well. And uh, the man on the, the other man on the right way out, he was a prisoner and he was a photographer. And Clark said, you've got to get pictures of all this. So we have to credit him with all these pictures. Can't imagine the emotions. Uh, oh, they, they still cry. They get emotional. 60, 70 years later, if you talk to them, they cannot talk about that day and particularly the flag, the American flag. Um, um, they still get all choked up when they talk about it. One of the interesting facts behind the scenes about this, I, and you probably are aware of this, but Patton's uh, son-in-law was in this camp. <laughs> no, no, he, he was. Well, no, he was in Hamelsburg. He was in one that was close by, and he admitted later on that was one of his biggest mistakes. He said he didn't know his son-in-law was there. I suspect he probably did, and he took a, a unit with him to try and. Uh, it was a disaster. He tried to get him out. And his son-in-law actually got very bad. He was shot around his knees and was very badly injured. And um, he was reprimanded for that because Ben said he wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> son-in-law captured at Kasserine Pass. Oh, it's yeah. Yeah, I believe me. I think you're right. Yeah. What a joyous ending. And we're running out of time, but we have to answer Don Patton's question. Okay. Who is this beautiful lady, Marilyn? Helga. <laughs> That's the real Helga. Real Helga. That is Lisa um, Panupo. That's Von Lindiner in his office. And I love this picture because there he had so many things on his desk and walls when Masters of the Air people and Orloff in the producers said, what did his office look like? Here it was. You know, what did his telephone look like? There it was over there, his pens, everything. Um, and she... Um, uh, was a censor. They, the camp had a lot of very young women censors. They were never mixed in the camp where the men were. They kind of lived off to the side and they censored all the male. And she became his um, his secretary. And ironically, my co-author, Mike Eberhardt, who is an attorney, uh, worked with other attorneys. And one he worked with um, um, had a re was related. We, we know I, we know her daughter. We know Lisa's daughter, and um, and they were there was that link between them and Stalin Glue Three after all those years later. And but they didn't was, realize it for years. How was this related to the comedy series Hogan's Heroes? Uh, well, that would be Helga, and that would be Colonel Clink. Yep. And um, there's there's uh, Lisa, and on the back we have this book. Um, and you can see it. They use this book as well from Commandant. We wrote his entire memoir is in this book. And at the end, we have her fascinating story. Like I said, we knew we know her daughter. And she has an unbelievable story. And it's in the back of that book. And um it's just incredible. Uh the commandant actually lived in a beautiful manor house about 10 or 12 miles from the camp with his uh wife, who was a Dutch baroness. And they had to get out. I think she had to get out quickly when the Russians were coming in. And she hid all of her jewels and her most valuable things. She wanted to take them with her. This Lisa was her escort trying to get her to the train station to get her away. And she said, you, you can't take all these. So she hid them. And we're not sure it was some kind of a box or it was, we don't know. But I think the Russians probably got everything later. But everybody was going to go to, on a treasure hunt and see where her things were. <laughs> she had beautiful oh. things. Don, do we answer your question about Hogan's Heroes? I think he needs to unmute, uh, Todd. Let's see here. Right. I got him, I think. There we go. Uh, yep. No, no, I, I want to know what the, uh, the the daughter's father, what the father's told of the daughters about Hogan's Heroes. Yes. Anita? What, what our fathers, Anita and I, what our fathers told us? Yes, yes. Um, my they dad, just, I just remember him laughing a lot about it. Yeah. He said we didn't they, they discuss baseball. what happened or was it true? He just mm -hmm. enjoyed it. So we let him enjoy it with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Questions were often not tolerated at my house. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> they, Career military. I mean, he, he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel. So mine did too. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, I think a lot of the stories were based on memoirs of POWs. I mean, their journals 
or I think like some of the cooking research. ideas and the shaving the wood and the way under the barracks the bed. looked and mm -hmm. yeah yeah and they were based on that and then they kind of branch off and but <laughs> tell both, me. Your father, both your fathers enjoyed the uh, series then yes very yes. much we watched it every week when it was on I remember that <laughs> <laughs> just the names changed <laughs> uh, uh, next week we got to do Mikhail's Navy exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Gomer Pyle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go through them all. That's right. Go through all of the services. Well, listen, we we've run over our our time, uh, and, and we ought to wind up. Although it's kind of difficult because just like last evening on our private conversation, it could have stayed on till midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been wonderful, and I, I just want to give a special thanks to Marilyn, Anita, and Colin uh, for your generous time and your incredible. Very deep. welcome. Yeah, very well. Uh, Susan, Susan Yu puts it here in the chat. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Marilyn, Anita, and Colin, thank you for keeping history alive. I feel so privileged to have been able to spend the past 90 minutes with you. You're very generous with your time and your expertise. Thank you so much. Thank you. The last episode will be the best one of Masters of the Air. It's going to be very emotional. Wow. <laughs> That's great. I've cried at all the others. <laughs> oh, well, wait till the last one. <laughs> That's right. right. Mar Marilyn has some information that we, we should probably uh, bribe her with uh, something. I'm not sure. Maybe that's, that might be possible. <laughs> Someday I'll tell you about all the different shoot down stories. They're fantastic. Some of these shoot down stories are, you couldn't make them up. What really happened? There's some, some funny ones. Some are very well, I've got, I've got stuff from the German side too. <laughs> you got the German. <laughs> that's another show. <laughs> we could do another show. Thank you. Fantastic program. Thank you all. Thank you. Glenn. Have a good weekend. Hope to see you next week. Take care, everyone.